From spotlighting former side characters to revisiting standout villains, there's a reason these stories might feel a little familiar. Super Cop is a martial arts action extravaganza released in 1992. The film represents the only live action starring collaboration between two legends of the genre, Jackie Chan and Michelle Yeoh. The plot revolves around Chan and Yeoh's characters going undercover to take down a dangerous criminal organization, complete with tons of fights and death-defying stunts along the way. Although the movie was released as simply Super Cop and marketed as a standalone film, to English language audiences, this is actually the third film in a series. The original Chinese title of the film is Police Story 3, Super Cop. The first two movies in Jackie Chan's Police Story series were massively successful and influential in the Hong Kong film industry, but were far less recognized and accessible in the West at the time of the third film's release. In addition to dubbing the film into English, distributor Miramax also changed the title, re-edited the film, and made substantial cuts totaling over eight minutes worth of footage, all of which made the story of Super Cop seem less like a sequel and more like a standalone film. Additionally, the soundtrack and sound effects were changed, a new highly stylized opening credit sequence was added, Jackie Chan's character had his name anglicized from Kakui Chan to Kevin Chan, and changes were made to the plot that further distanced the story from the series that preceded it. These days, most people are familiar with the Mad Max series as a whole, from the originator to Fury Road, and all the way to the upcoming Furiosa. But that wasn't always the case. It took a while for the first Mad Max to reach international audiences, as it was made with a low budget and only received a limited release at first. The sequel, however, had breakthrough power right off the bat and became an international hit straight away. Since Mad Max was practically unheard of in the US at the time the sequel was released, its title was changed from Mad Max 2 to The Road Warrior. You want to get out of here? You talk to me. The Road Warrior went on to become a huge success in the US as an original standalone film, and it wasn't until later on that audiences went back and discovered the original Mad Max. The connective tissue between the first and second Mad Max movies is quite slim in the first place, so the sequel distancing itself didn't change much. With the first film lacking the budget to properly pull off the dusty post-apocalyptic future aesthetic, Mad Max 2 feels like a hard reset for the series and barely feels like it's set in the same world as the first movie anyway. Writer-director M. Night Shyamalan burst onto the Hollywood scene with a couple of high-quality, twisty thrillers in The Sixth Sense and Unbreakable. Unfortunately, his reputation began to diminish over time with a string of notorious disasters. In 2016, though, Shyamalan mounted a surprise return to form with Split. James McAvoy stars as a man with numerous split personalities who abducts three teenagers. One of the teens, played by Anya Taylor-Joy, is determined to escape. What begins as a psychological thriller takes on a supernatural aspect as it moves along. Uh, holy sh This is so cool! It isn't until the film has come to a close that a post-end title scene reveals Split to be set within the same universe as Shyamalan's earlier Unbreakable. The two films would coalesce more directly in his next movie, Glass. Split turned out to not just be a return to form for Shyamalan, but also a return to his roots. As Shyamalan revealed in an interview with Entertainment Weekly, this character, Kevin, from Split, was in the original script of Unbreakable. Instead of bumping into the orange suit man, David bumps into one of Kevin's personalities and goes to save the girls. So you'd have been watching the girls' side of it the whole time. Get, The Trial of Vivian Amsalem is an Israeli drama from 2014. The film stars the highly lauded Ronan Elkabetz in the titular role of Vivian Amsalem, a woman seeking a divorce within Israel's rabbinical marriage system, which requires the full consent of the husband. In addition to giving an incredibly impressive lead performance, Ronan Elkabetz also co-wrote and co-directed the film alongside her brother Shlomi Elkabetz. She passed away just two years later at the age of 51 as a result of cancer. As a festival and awards darling, Get had strong international appeal and broke through to far-reaching audiences around the world. Many who watched the film were completely unaware of the fact that Get is the conclusion to a trilogy. The film tells what feels like a completely self-contained story, 
but Ronit Alkabets had previously portrayed the Vivian Amsalem character in To Take a Wife and Shiva, and all three films were written and directed by the Alkabet siblings. Simon Abkarian also stars in all three films as Vivian's husband, Elysia, and the entire trilogy focuses on the interpersonal drama involved in their family and marriage. There was a substantial gap in time between the first two movies and the third, and Get makes no mention of the previous movies, nor does it require any knowledge of the characters' backstories. Get Em to the Greek is a raunchy 2010 comedy about an intern played by Jonah Hill tasked with transporting a wild, unpredictable musician played by Russell Brand from the UK to Los Angeles to get to an important concert on time. The film was a modest box office success and earned the certified fresh badge from critics on Rotten Tomatoes. As well received as Get Em to the Greek was though, it is a secret sequel to a movie that performed even better. Before filmmaker Nicholas Stoller made Get Him to the Greek, he made Forgetting Sarah Marshall as his directorial debut. Jason Siegel, who wrote and starred in Forgetting Sarah Marshall, was not a driving force in the sequel, though he remained involved as a co-producer. Stoller wrote Get Him to the Greek himself and elevated the standout supporting character, played by Russell Brand, in Forgetting Sarah Marshall to a leading role. Why did you do this to me? Out of love. Throughout his relatively short stint as a big-budget comedy leading man, Russell Brand was quite severely typecast, something which he knowingly embraced. His screen image aligned closely with the persona he had earlier crafted as a stand-up comedian, and his rock star character in the two Nicholas Stoller comedies fit snugly within that typecast wheelhouse. With Brand playing so many similar rich, addict, playboy-type characters, it was easy for audiences to miss the fact that he was playing the exact same character and not just a similar one in Forgetting Sarah Marshall and Get Him to the Greek. Sin. Be cool. Be cool? You don't know me. Be Cool is a gangster comedy set in the expensive and high-profile world of the music industry. If that premise sounds familiar, it's because Be Cool is a sequel to Get Shorty and kept the same basic plot while making the simple switch of transporting gangster Chili Palmer from the film industry to the music industry. Get Shorty is often considered a highlight of its genre, but Be Cool, on the other hand, has fallen into obscurity and largely been forgotten about these days, despite being a full 10 years more recent than its famous predecessor. Even though Be Cool featured a star-studded cast packed with the likes of John Travolta, Uma Thurman, Dwayne Johnson, Vince Vaughn, Harvey Keitel, Danny DeVito, and more, the film was a financial disappointment and a major critical failure. This sequel cost more than twice as much to make and brought back less money at the box office than the first movie. With the runaway success of the original, it is a surprise that the film's marketing didn't lean more heavily into Be Cool being a direct sequel, though the full decade that transpired between the two films might explain that decision. One has to wonder if the film would have been more commercially successful if it were called Get Shorty 2 and had been made closer to the original, though the weak critical reception would likely have been unaltered. Although the film was critically divisive, 2005's The Devil's Rejects was a hit amongst horror fans and has remained Rob Zombie's most successful original film. The story follows three psychotic criminals known as the Firefly Family, played by Sid Haig, Bill Mosley, and Sherry Moon Zombie as they torment unsuspecting victims. They are put on the defensive when a vengeful sheriff, played by William Forsyth, proves willing to break the law to take them down, and he just might be even more disturbed than them. The story of The Devil's Rejects is completely self-contained, but this trio of main characters made their first appearance two years earlier in Rob Zombie's feature film directorial debut, House of 1000 Corpses. This first film was extremely light on story, and Zombie's background as a musician and music video director are impossible to miss. The plot of House of 1000 Corpses is mostly a disposable excuse to get to the violence, but Zombie knew he was scratching at the surface of something more interesting with the Firefly family. When he revisited them in his next film, the result was a more cohesive story and a more mature film. 14 years later, Zombie revisited these characters once more and three from hell. This is 40 is a 2012 comedy from writer, director, and producer Judd Apatow. Paul Rudd and Leslie Mann 
play a married couple who face a pair of midlife crises as they both turn 40 while navigating myriad troubles in their lives and their relationship. Given how simple and down-to-earth these characters are, it was easy for audiences to miss the fact that they had seen them on screen before. We're like Simon and Garfunkel, and somehow you turned me into Garfunkel. I don't even know what that means. Art Garfunkel. What's wrong with Art Garfunkel? Rudd and Man first played this particular married couple five years earlier in Apatow's Knocked Up. The two were prominent supporting characters who were upgraded to leads for This Is 40 and given their time in the spotlight. The plot of Knocked Up has little to no bearing on the events of This Is 40, and Seth Rogen and Katherine Heigl's two lead characters are not present. For a film about aging and looking back on one's youth, it makes perfect sense to revisit characters that were first explored on screen at an earlier stage in their lives. The Purity of Vengeance, which is also known as Journal 64, was released in Denmark in 2018 and quickly became the highest grossing movie in the history of the Danish film industry. The story follows two detectives, played by Nikolai Lee Kaz and Fariz Fariz, as they investigate a disturbing mystery involving abducted girls, medical experiments, and mummified corpses. Although the story functions as a self-contained mystery plot, The Purity of Vengeance is actually the fourth film in the mystery thriller series known as Department Q, which are all adapted from the novel series of the same name. The first three films all contain the series name in their titles. Department Q, The Keeper of Lost Causes, Department Q, The Absent One, and Department Q, A Conspiracy of Faith. For the fourth outing, Department Q was dropped from both versions of its title. This title switch up allowed new viewers to jump right into the latest movie without feeling the need to have already seen the previous entries and undoubtedly played a role in the purity of vengeance becoming the highest grossing entry in the series by far. 2004's 2046 is a romantic drama from acclaimed Hong Kong filmmaker Wong Kar Wai. Tony Lung stars as an author writing a science fiction novel and the film moves in and out of reality and the fictional world of his book. The title has many meanings, as 2046 refers to the futuristic setting of the sci-fi book, as well as the number of a room where nothing ever changes, which is the destination of the novel's characters. 2046 is also the number of the hotel room where Lung's character experiences the doomed romance that haunts him and is the room he currently resides next door to while writing the book in room 2047. From the outside, 2046 appears to be a self-contained story, and one could watch the film and never realize that it was a part of a series, but they would be missing out on the bigger picture. The past romance that haunts the science fiction author isn't just character backstory. It was the subject of Wong Kar Wai's highly lauded 2000 film, In the Mood for Love. Tony Lung and Maggie Chung also played the same characters a decade earlier in Wong Kar Wai's 1990 film, Days of Being Wild. Though each film can be watched and enjoyed independently, the full scope of the story and characters can only be found by watching the entire trilogy.